I'll go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. That's where we're going to start. We'll get there in just a little bit. Today, the lesson has us doing stuff a little bit differently. There won't be as many questions as we engage the text. There's stuff to walk through um, all together, but that's okay. I'll go ahead and start talking while he's handing those out. Uh, in, in past lessons, the last eight weeks, we've introduced you to the Bible, uh, where it came from, how to study it, why we can believe it. Those are critical areas of learning. But today we're going to talk about what is the central message of the Bible. So if you start at the beginning at the Garden of Eden, where Adam's sin affects us all, uh, in Genesis we hear of God's plan of a Redeemer who would crush the serpent's head, Genesis 3.15. Uh, right in the midst of the devastation and death as the consequence of the fall, God offers a word of hope that there is one who will come from the woman's seed who will crush the head of the serpent. He will undo all that the serpent has done. Scholars call Genesis 3.15 the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. And Jesus the Messiah fulfills that prophecy revealing God's plan as the Redeemer. And to truly understand the good news of the Bible, we have to first grasp the bad news. Because God is a holy God. He cannot and does not dwell with sinful man. His perfect justice demands that he punish disobedience. So the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and come short of his glory, Romans 3.23. It then tells us that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And that's the bad news. That people are separated from God. We're spiritually dead under his just penalty, and we are destined for an eternity in hell. That's the bad news. There's absolutely no way to work, to earn God's favor or his salvation, to merit eternal life, um, Isaiah 64, 6 likens our attempts at doing that as filthy rags. And the good news is that God sent his son to live a sinless life, to fill that gap that we could not fill, and then to pay by his death the penalty of death that we deserve. And through the cross, we see the justice of God satisfied. We see the love of God demonstrated. And Jesus' death for our sins and his burial and resurrection are the heart of of the good news. So how do we respond to receive that salvation? We repent of sin and believe the gospel. We place our trust in the living Lord Jesus. The Bible promises that those who trust in Christ are saved. When that occurs, we are adopted as sons and daughters, joint heirs with Christ. We're born again into a new and living hope, 1 Peter 1, 3. We become a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And we have the sure hope of eternal life, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. But it's not until you grasp the bad news that you can then appreciate the good news. And in today's pluralistic society, with any number of religions and insistence on tolerance, it's important that we understand that the good news of the Bible is not just one good news among many good newses. It is the only one. The Bible clearly teaches that faith in Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel, is the only way to be reconciled to God. Jesus is the only mediator between God and mankind, 1 Timothy 2.5. John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4.12 confirms there is no other name other than Jesus' name by which we must be saved. He's it. No other person, no other man-made religion offers the path of salvation and reconciliation with God. Merely believing that God exists or believing there is a God doesn't save anyone. Scripture tells us that even demons believe, James 2.19. It's only through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus, his, his work on the cross, that anyone is saved. And the early church, through the book of Acts, preached that gospel amid much opposition. For the first two centuries of the life of the church, Christians were persecuted and killed and ostracized for their message. 
Yet the gospel spread throughout the known world and the blood of the martyrs seemed to only validate the message and increase its power. And then in AD 312, the Roman emperor Constantine converted to the faith of Christianity and he commanded an official toleration of Christianity and all other religions. And then in the year AD 380, Emperor Theodosius made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And from that point on, Christians were able to worship openly, and they enjoyed governmental protection and favor. But from that place of safety, through the next several centuries, segments of the church began to include some doctrines and some practices that were not found in the Bible. The special authority of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. The concept of purgatory as a place for afterlife purification of sins. The immaculate conception and assumption of Mary. The doctrine of transubstantiation, that in the Eucharist, in communion, the, the bread becomes the, the actual body of Jesus and the wine or the juice becomes his actual blood. The general belief that your good works have to outweigh the bad in order to attain eternal life. And while the true gospel had been corrupted by church leaders, God always preserves a remnant who are faithful to his word and believe the truth of his word. So in the 15th and 16th centuries, that remnant courageously began a movement known as the Protestant Reformation. They protested against these false views. That's why we swim in the broad stream of Protestant Christianity. We protest for the truth of the gospel. And God used those believers to restore, to rediscover the gospel message, justification by faith in Christ alone, the truth that the Bible contains. Today, in the Western church, from a place of relative safety, we find the church seemingly corrupted and moving away from the truth and simplicity of the gospel message. And many churches distort the word of God to attract more people to come to their church. See sermon from today as exhibit A. The last five minutes of it are basically a sarcastic rant uh, against those churches. It's super fun. Those false messages that are proclaimed range anywhere from prosperity preaching, uh, that God's number one goal is that you be healthy and wealthy, uh, to what's called easy believism. I'll just say a few words in a church service and you're saved for all of eternity, no matter what you do after that, to counseling sessions based on secular psychology, come see us, we can, we can fix your life, to universalism that anyone can get to heaven as long as they're sincere in what they believe? Who are we to say that they're wrong? Oh, we're nobody, but God's word is what it says. The list could go on. As Christians, we're called to be very discerning in what we hear and to stand on the authority of God's word alone. So we've been talking about building this biblical worldview over the last eight weeks. We've talked about who God is and how he's revealed himself to us in creation and in the Bible, and why we trust the Bible as our authority to look to. The Bible is authoritative because it reflects the character of the God who gave it to us. It's written down by men, yes, but they were superintended by God the Holy Spirit, and these writings are inspired. They come directly from the Lord himself. So what if we believe that all that's true, but don't heed the main message of the text? So that's what we're going to talk about, the message that is at the core of the Bible's teaching, which is the gospel. So what is the gospel? Well, we want to make sure we know what the gospel is. The, the root of the word is, is the Greek word euangelion. So eu, eu is the prefix that means good, and angelion, you, you hear angel in there. Because angel is just a messenger. So angel is message or messenger. So it's good news. That's where we get our word evangelism. So when you evangelize, you are quite literally 
gospeling them when you are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, which contains in, in quite a condensed form the, the core elements of what the gospel is. And then we're going to move on and talk about some things throughout the text of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I proclaimed to you as good news, unless you believed for nothing. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So throughout those just few verses, there are three core elements to the truth of the gospel. Christ died and was buried and was raised from the dead. That is the core truth of the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is our hope. If, if that did not happen, we're in deep weeds. If that is not true, the New Testament church falls apart. The truth of the gospel is the core message that holds it all together. So we could simply walk up to someone and say, Jesus died for your sins. And that is possibly true of of how that could work, and but that's going to be responded to with what? They don't know what that would even mean. Again, even though the concept of sin itself is watered down and not talked about today, the, the concept of sin is ignored. So people might even claim that they're not sinners. Uh, they are what one author called mistakers. Um, or we have misordered priorities. Um, yeah, I've got some things I need to work on. It's, it's probably more than that. So what is it that makes the gospel good news? Well, the good news is only good because there's bad news. That's what makes it good. It's contrasted with the bad. So it's necessary for someone to understand the peril that they are in, spiritually speaking, before they can understand the, the appreciation of being saved from that danger. In order to understand the need for a cure, you have to understand the diagnosis. So there are a lot of different evangelistic methods of talking to people about the truth of the gospel. This curriculum picks one in particular uh, that walks through all of human history, which is, you know, kind of a big deal to walk through all of human history to use it to explain the bad news and the good news. So what we're going to do today is simply walk through that. Uh, those seven C's of history. So your note taking is going to be on the second page that you have in your handout. You can tell it's, it's printed off from a curriculum. So it's what what they have provided for us. I didn't design that uh, this week. I don't even know how to do that. So we're going to walk through these seven seasons, and there's a future lesson coming where we're going to dive more deeply into these. This is just a quick, broad overview of these seven seas, and there'll be a couple questions as we walk through it together. This is a big picture perspective of the history of the universe and the bad news that leads to the need for good news. So, uh, as I mentioned different scripture verses, write those down uh, underneath these seven C's, because they will provide for you a manner in which you can sit down and share the gospel with someone as you overview all of world history with them. So number one is creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, to, through chapter 2, verse 4. Genesis 1.31 to 2.4. Here's what the text says. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening, there was morning the sixth day. 
Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. On the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because on it, he rested from all his work, which God had created in making it. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made earth and heaven. So when God created the earth, when God created mankind, everything is described as very good. There is no death. There is no disease. There is no suffering. There is no sin in the world. Adam and Eve live in paradise in relationship, unhindered relationship with the God who made them. And there's only one thing that they are prohibited from doing. And what do they do? You want what you can't have, right? You can have all the trees in the garden. You can have all the trees on the whole planet. This one tree, that one's mine. Don't eat from my tree. Well, that's the best tree. It's got the best fruit. So they did. They're tempted to eat from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan had promised to Eve, when you eat it, your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to be like God. Well, he was partially telling the truth. Their eyes were definitely opened and they saw things they had never seen before. Death and destruction. Sin ruining the perfection of creation. So, which leads to number two, corruption. Genesis chapter three, verses six and seven. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food. That was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. What cool, interesting paradise it must be to be naked and not even know it. That's not my reality. I'm always very aware. It's just the way that it is. Eyes have been opened to those things. Genesis chapter 3, 21 to 23. Genesis 3, 21 to 23. Then Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Then Yahweh God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he send forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. All of us are corrupted by Adam's sin. Romans 5, verses 18 and 19 which all Romans 5 is, is theological commentary on Genesis 3. That's what Paul is looking back on and telling us what happened theologically in the Garden of Eden. Romans 5, 18 and 19. So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners. Even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be appointed righteous. So God understands before the foundation of the world what's going to happen. God has foreordained all the things that are going to happen. In fact, 1 Peter 1.20 says that Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world that he would be our redeemer. He was assigned before the foundation of the world. This is how it's going to go down, Jesus. This is what you're going to do. So the question remains, why would God even bother? Uh, I mean, this is one of the common questions we get all the time. So if God knew... If he's really sovereign, he knows that this is how it's all going to go down, that Adam and Eve are going to sin and Jesus is going to have to die. Why not just not do that? Well, without sin, without a savior, you and I have no knowledge of mercy. We have no knowledge of grace. We have no knowledge of what it means to be loved in spite of ourselves. God would never have been able to put those character qualities on display had it not been 
for the reality of sin and the need for a Savior. Now, what can we infer happened? Genesis 3, God made them garments of skin. What can we infer happened to make them garments of skin? Something died. Yeah, there was a sacrifice. So this is the first record of any death in all of human history. And it represents a foreshadowing of the death of the perfect Lamb of God who would come to take away, not just cover up, but to take away the sins of the world. So from Genesis 3, we come to discover that to cover over humanity's sin, it requires the death of another. That will be encoded in the Levitical law, the sacrificial law of these innocent animals, the spotless, blemish-free lambs and goats and all of that that are sacrificed. The blood of another has to cover over your sin. All of that is pointing to Christ, that his blood will cover over our sin. Number three, catastrophe. Genesis 6, verse 5 through 8. Then Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That would be a good summation of humanity right there. Every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Verse six, and Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. Genesis chapter eight, verse one. This is now after the flood. Then God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Genesis 8, verses 15 to 17. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth that they may swarm on the earth and that they may be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So after the Garden of Eden, sin continued to increase on the earth. God judges the sinfulness of mankind with a global flood that destroys every living creature in the world, including every human being in the world, except for the eight that were on the ark. Only they were spared the judgment of God. So why was Noah saved from God's judgment? It would be easy to say, oh, it's because Noah was awesome. I mean, everybody else is terrible, but here's this perfect guy. Noah's awesome. We we love Noah. And and God says, well, I can't can't kill Noah. He's too good to kill. Everybody else, they're just awful. But Noah's not. Noah's not the case. What did Genesis 6, 8 say? But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. The word for favor is the word for grace. It was an act of grace that God saved Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, absolutely the case. But he was not perfect. He still fell under the condemnation of that overarching phrase of every inclination of his heart was only evil continually. That's still true of Noah and his family, but God chooses to show grace to Noah. Number four, confusion. Genesis 11, one to nine. Now the whole earth had the same language and the same words, and it happened as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Shinar eventually becomes Babylon which is ironic that this is where human corruption centers. And all the way to the book of Revelation, Babylon is known as the whore of Babylon in rejection and rebellion against God. Uh, Verse three, then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they made brick for stone. They had tar for mortar. 
And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Then Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And Yahweh said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they have begun to do. So now nothing which they propose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's language. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth and from there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. After the flood, God had commanded Noah and his descendants to fill the whole earth. And they didn't. They were disobedient. They all congregated together in the same place and decided, because the intention of man's heart is only evil continually, you know what we should do? Let's just anchor here. Forget what God said. Let's anchor here. Let's build a tower. For what purpose? To go into the heavens. Why? Because that's where we belong. We're that good. Let's make a name for ourselves. At, at, at Babel, you see the, the wretchedness of human pride put on display. So God comes down and destroys their unity. Ironic that we're talking about unity today at church, but this God destroys their unity, confuses their language, and scatters them around the world as he had commanded them to go. And now they go, and despite their skin color or nationality or facial features or their language, all people on planet Earth trace their heritage back to Adam through Noah. Everyone, all of mankind is in need of salvation from their sin because we're all descended from Adam. So why then would Jesus command the disciples to make disciples of all the nations? Why go to all the nations? Because all of them need salvation. Because all of them have descended from Babel. All of them fall under the condemnation of Adam. Why do we see in Revelation 5, around the throne of God, people from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, all worshiping Christ in heaven? It's all because of Genesis 11 in the Tower of Babel. This confusion of language that is remedied in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. When they are miraculously given the ability to speak languages they do not know. So that now, in the confusion of those languages, the gospel can go to all languages because God is saving people from every people group in the, in the world. So all that's the bad news. Every person has sinned is in need of salvation from God's just judgment. Jesus is the only one who can ever save. So number five is Christ. John chapter one, verses 14 to 17. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has been ahead of me, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. As promised since Genesis 3.15, the Savior was coming. And all of these Old Testament prophecies, there are 475 of them, all pointed to this one to come, and Jesus perfectly fulfills every single one of them. Christ comes into the world as God in the flesh. The Word became flesh. John 1.14 lives a perfect sinless life, and he becomes the last Adam. There's the first Adam that condemned us all, and there's the last Adam that saves. Number six, the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the gospel in a single verse. The innocent Christ takes humanity's sin onto himself so that his perfect righteousness would be then credited to us. Christ lives a sinless life, willingly offers himself as the perfect sacrifice. God pours out his wrath on our sin, on Christ, so that he doesn't pour it out on us. 
And to demonstrate that he was victorious over the death that Adam had brought, he rose bodily from the grave on the third day. Appears, 1 Corinthians 15, to more than 500 witnesses. 515 of them are listed in particular in 1 Corinthians 15. Then he ascends, Acts chapter 1, to his rightful place at the right hand of God the Father to rule and reign over all of his creation. That's the good news that offers the freedom from the bad news of sin and judgment. So when Christ does his drawing work in us and we repent of our sins and we place our trust in his work on our behalf, we are transferred from death to life. As Colossians 1 will say, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Rather than facing the eternal punishment for sin and hell, we spend eternity with God in heaven. Christ pays the penalty for our sin. We receive his righteousness, the great exchange. What a gift that is. Number seven, last one, consummation. Revelation 21, one to eight. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. There's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, they are done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, which is the A and the Z of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So Christ will return. And he will judge the world in righteousness. The curse will be removed. And a new heaven and a new earth will be the dwelling place of God with his people. But for those who are not in Christ, their eternity will be a lake of fire that awaits those who die in their sin apart from Christ. Romans 7, Paul describes how he knew of his need for salvation because he understood what sin was. In order for the good news of salvation from sin to make sense, a person has to understand the bad news of sin entering the world and corrupting God's perfect creation. And understanding the history of the world helps us to see it began in perfection and it fell in sin. It's been redeemed in Christ and will be forever so into eternity. That helps us to make the gospel clear. So the gospel is not just the core message of scripture. The gospel is the core message of history. It is the message that undergirds all things from the moment God breathed the universe into existence into eternity future where we will be with him for all time. That is good news, don't you think? One, two, three, go team. We'll see you next Sunday.